All right. Uh, thanks, um, Fintan, for the introduction. Um, really happy to be here. So my name is uh, Johan Stocking. I am uh, co-founder and tech lead of the Things Network. Um, who of you has heard of the Things Network? Really cool. Who is a Kickstarter backer? All right. We have some. Pretty cool. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I'm going to start with um, the uh, inconvenient truth, truth about constrained devices. Uh, we've been talking a lot yesterday uh, about IoT platforms and uh, connectivity. Um, but if you look at real constrained devices that have uh, constrained power, memory, um, processing power, and connectivity, um, then actually if you look at the devices, then you can have first, uh, there is no internet in things. So we've been talking yesterday about um, IP communications and how hard UDP is in a device, but in many things, real constrained devices, um, there is not even UDP. Um, so it's too expensive to have 4G or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth low energy. You need to have an access point nearby. Uh, it's very power consuming. Silicon is <coughs> relatively expensive. Um, while many solutions are battery driven. So if you look today uh, on Amazon in their uh, web shop and you search for IoT starter kit, then you have these uh, all IP based uh, starter kits. And this is good. This is to make people aware of IoT and, and embedded programming. Um, but really, most devices are, are really stupid. And they have to be. They can be. Because the more stupid they are, uh, the less power they consume. Um, if you do a lot of processing in the cloud, like even converting an analog reading to a Celsius value. If you do that on the device, you do floating point calculations. Um, you want to avoid them if it's a really low power uh, solution, for example. Uh, also, um, uh, if you look at the connectivity and communications, then um, yeah, free and open communication is, is a proven success. Um, this is true for the internet. And if you look at the history of the internet, it started with um, also with yeah, closed uh, military or university networks, um, also so, uh, social media uh, platforms that were closed or invite only, uh, they all became successful once they opened up uh, and became accessible for everybody to use. Uh, so with this in mind, um, last year and also with the um, availability of LoRa, uh, we started the Things Network. Uh, LoRa is a um, long range, low power modulation. And um, it's designed for connecting the Internet of Things um, without using uh, anything related to the IP stack. Um, there is a LoRa Alliance, and the LoRa Alliance consists of hundreds of uh, companies in IoT industry, uh, including commercial operators, uh, but also um, uh, universities and uh, chip makers and, 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 and operators like us, uh, communities. Um, if you look at the gateways, they have a really high capacity. Um, this is, these are just numbers for, for one single gateway. Um, but since LoRa is a radio protocol, you can simply add capacity by adding more gateways to the region where you need capacity. So you, um, you don't have any pairing between the device and a specific gateway. Um, so um, you can just add another gateway and uh, you add capacity to, to the network. Also, because it's so low power and the messages are super small, um, you can have devices running up for months or years on a battery or completely autonomous using uh, solar panels. Also, it uses is the um, unlicensed spectrum. So the, the spectrum is regulated almost everywhere. Um, but there are parts of the spectrum that you can use. Uh, for example, you can set up your own Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth uh, hotspot, but you cannot uh, start broadcasting on air traffic control frequencies, for example. And this is just mostly a matter of frequencies, transmission power, uh, duty cycle, and, and things like that. Uh, and LoRa uses the, um, the so-called ISM bands that are originally um, uh, assigned for uh, industrial, scientific, and medical use. Uh, in Europe, it's uh, around 868 megahertz. In US, it's 915. And the LoRa Alliance is currently um, uh, publishing specifications for uh, Southeast Asia and um, uh, South America and Canada. So if you look at long-range communication, um, I, I always explain it like this. If you are close to somebody, you can speak fast and quiet. Uh, this is like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Um, if, it's, uh, if you're further away from somebody, so we're talking about 
uh, in cities, uh, two, three, four, five kilometers. Outside city, 10, 15 kilometers. Uh, you have to speak slow and loud. So slow is, is a very low data rate. Uh, and what means loud? Well, there are two different types of loud in radio communications. First, you have narrow band, which is like putting a lot of power on a specific frequency. Uh, or you can use spread spectrum, and this is what LoRa uses. So this is what you see here on the left. Uh, it's communication below the noise level, and it's spreading out uh, the symbols um, around a center frequency. And it's what you see on the right if you do a spectrum analysis of, um, of a LoRa packet. So how it relates to other wireless communication uh, protocols and modulations, um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's long range um, and it's low bandwidth. Uh, also, um, LoRa 1, which is the software protocol on top of LoRa, um, uh, can also be used on FSK modulation. And all the radio chips uh, that you have today in LoRa, they also support FSK. So this is much like Bluetooth, which gives a much higher throughput uh, while you use the same hardware, but your, your range is limited. Um, so about LoRa 1, um, there are three device classes. I won't go into all the details, but there, are, there is um, a possibility to send data back to the devices. Uh, either a device initiates communication and it allows you to send data back to your device. Uh, or in class B, uh, the device sets up a synchronization with the network. And for example, every 15 minutes there is a a window for the network to send a scheduled message back to the device and the rest of the time the message is in low power sleep mode. And class C, it's a continuous listening device and this is where you probably need a, a power supply. Uh, so for example, class A, if, you, uh, if a device sends a message, um, then uh, the communication is initiated by the device and there are two receive windows uh, that the device opens to, it uh, powers on the receiving antenna and um, uh, waits for a reply from the network. So this is how you can do request response. Uh, but as you can see, this is, this is too slow, too limited for, uh, for IP communication. Uh, security, um, although LoRa is uh, low power and low cost, um, the, uh, there is AES 128-bit encryption uh, built in LoRa 1. And um, it uses a, um, a symmetric key from which the um, uh, session keys are derived. So you have a, a network session key and an application session key. And this key pair uh, also allows for end-to-end -end encryption because networks only need the network session key to uh, route data. And the user end application is the only one that has the application session key, uh, which is used to encrypt and decrypt payload. Uh, there are two ways to activate devices on the network. You can either um, use over-the-air activation where you uh, set up a new session every time a device uh, connects to the network. So it's, it's like much like uh, dynamic IP addressing. Uh, or you can have uh, personalization where you program the session keys in the device. Uh, you can change it much like static IP. Uh, so security, um, if you have a device and an application, you have on either end, you have the app key, uh, the network. In this case, the Things Network doesn't have to know what the app key is. Um, from the app key, the application derives a network session key. Uh, the device does the same calculation, so it calculates the same network session key. Uh, the network uses this network session key to route data, and the application session key is used to encrypt and decrypt payloads. So if you put a box around it, if you say that's the network, the LoRa network, you have end-to-end -end encryption uh, on application level. Um, limitations. Uh, so uh, LoRa is, in terms of bandwidth, it's very limited. Um, and we calculate everything in, time in air time. Uh, so um, you have a payload size, so depending on how much data you send and uh, the data rate is how fast you send the data, uh, you can calculate how much time it takes to send the message. And in Europe, um, we, have to, we are dealing with uh, the duty cycle, and the duty cycle says, for example, that your uh, antenna has to be silent for 99% of the time. Um, so it's important to, to calculate how much time it takes to send a message and also to minimize um, uh, the, the payload size. So for example, if you want to send a temperature value, uh, you can do that in JSON, you can add a counter to it. Um, this is a really nice message that every application can process, but this is not very efficient. 
so you can, if you still want to use JSON, you can make it more compact, compress it, um, uh, remove white space, uh, compress it to 11 bytes, and this allows you with this uh, airtime limitation, which is only uh, in, in Europe uh, primarily, um, you can still send almost 500 messages per day. But you can also uh, don't use JSON, which is even better, or just send the two bytes. Uh, and this is also where we, where we are um, uh, developing tooling for to make it very easy to send data structures with very, very limited uh, number of bytes. So we started last year with this mission of the Things Network to build a decentralized, open, and crowdsourced Internet of Things data network that's owned and operated by its users. And um, we know how important IoT meetups are because we have one in Amsterdam. And uh, we went there with this mission and we validated it. And, um, and we asked, hey, what, what do you think? Uh, do you think this is a good idea? And uh, the response was, was pretty positive. So uh, Winke, my co-founder, um, started calling companies that were um, uh, interested in IoT, working on IoT, or companies that we used to work for in the past. And um, uh, because we wanted to do this crowdsource, so he called him saying, hey, this is our idea. Do you want to buy a gateway? We can buy, install it, put it on your roof, and you become part of one big network. And this is how we want to cover the city of Amsterdam in a few weeks. At the same time, I was building the backend, so I had this stack of LoRaWAN specifications, PDF, um, and I was uh, implementing the, the, the backend. Um, I was uh, doing this from Barcelona, working remote with uh, a friend, uh, Luke, a British guy, and uh, we were drinking beer at night, and um, we came up with a project title, Croft. So we had our project, it was called Laura Croft. And uh, Laura Croft is, uh, we discontinued it last week, uh, so it ran for, uh, for almost a year. Uh, and, um, and we had our first use case. So in Amsterdam, we have uh, boats in the canals, and they sink all the time. And uh, we wanted to develop a sensor where, which you can put in a boat. And if there is water in the boat, it would send a message to the owner. And this is a really good use case, because it's in cities, it's outside. Uh, you never know where the boat is. You, you, you can't uh, in any way connect to a Wi-Fi access point, because uh, you never know which one it is. Uh, and it's low power and a very valuable message for the owner because you can go to your boat and uh, clear it before it actually sinks. Um, so it would send a message to the owner and this says, uh, hey, your boat is running water. So th this was the whole use case, built in an afternoon, uh, once we had, of course, the, uh, the first backend uh, working. So um, then we did a Kickstarter campaign because uh, hardware is pretty expensive. And um, um, we, uh, the gateways, I think, are around 450, 500 euro. Uh, so um, we did a Kickstarter campaign with our own gateway, uh, which you can see on the left, uh, development board, which is uh, Arduino-based um, development board, and a node, which contains some sensors, LED, a push button, which you can use for very simple use cases. It's also weather sealed. Um, yeah, so um, we, are, uh, we had some delays, as with any Kickstarter campaign, uh, but we are shipping in November. Uh, this is a um, mock-up of the gateway. Um, you can see the gateway module and the, the PCB that's our own design. So how the network works, uh, currently it's decentralized. So um, if you have, uh, for example, um, uh, three gateways, with, uh, they provide coverage for nodes. Um, they are connected, the gateways are connected to uh, a router that's a cloud service and it can be a private network but it can also be the public community network uh, and actually it's a star of stars network um, where private networks can also connect with each other they can also do it peer-to-peer -peer, by the way um, and eventually the data ends up in the user application um, we deploy this globally and we're using Microsoft Azure to do that uh, they have really fast links between their data centers um, and uh, we need to have the uh, surfacer, surfers close to the gateways uh, because of the timing constraints that we have. So I showed you the slide with the uh, class A uplink message. Um, the radio of the node opens up one second after it sends an uplink message. So that means that we have to be able to make the entire round trip within one second. So that needs uh, really fast networking. Uh, and that is what we spend a lot of time on. Uh, we're also deploying in China. Uh, as you can see, it's not connected to the rest of the network. That's because of um, a Chinese regulation. Uh, but we're working closely with a Chinese uh, company to deploy the network there as well. 
Um, so the routing, um, the way it goes is that uh, if you have gateways, they are connected to this router. They use a network uh, service discovery to find a broker. And um, uh, the broker is connected to an application handler. Uh, this, is, this is all uh, distributed. Um, the purple handler, that it's, that's the handler that you run yourself. All these components are open source, by the way, so you can set up your own network as well. Um, if you have uh, your own handler, then you also own the uh, encryption key. Uh, so this is where the application payload is encrypted and decrypted. But you can also set up your private network. So you can also just deploy the private network uh, on your own servers or in AWS or in Azure or in IBM Cloud. Um, uh, this gives you full control over your uh, data flow. Um, but at the same time, you can connect this to uh, the public community network. And this gives your private network um, a coverage from the community network, but it also gives back coverage to the community network. So this is where you can enable sharing economy with your own uh, private LoRa network. So connecting applications, um, so how to get the data. Uh, so we have a few different models. Uh, first, um, you can get data directly from an MQTT broker. Uh, we build um, SDKs to make it easier to connect to the Things Network, but underneath it's all MQTT. Um, you can also process data in Node-RED. We have a, a Node-RED node, um, which you can easily use to connect to, to the Things Network. Um, we also uh, are building uh, REST API storage, just so putting everything in the database, making it available. So this is not streaming, but it's for historical um, uh, use. And finally, and I think this is, this is uh, what most applications will use, is an integration with an IoT cloud platform. Um, and we are building integrations uh, with, um, with the bigger IoT cloud platforms. Um, so first up are the three usual suspects, uh, Azure, AWS, IoT. Uh, and the uh, IBM um, uh, Watson IoT cloud, as it's called uh, today. Also, we have the Node-RED node, and um, uh, we are building also integrations with, uh, with open sensors and if this, then that. Um, this, these integrations are not only um, uplink messages. Uh, they, we also support downlink messages, so you can also have uh, data back from an IoT platform all the way over the Things Network to the right gateway to your end device. Um, and we also do device registry synchronization. So uh, if this IoT cloud platform already has a device registry, uh, then we can synchronize that um, with our database uh, and we can synchronize security keys. So you can actually use only this um, IoT cloud platform and you don't, uh, apart from uh, initial configuration, you don't have to deal with the Things Network anymore. Um, it's open source and the reason why it's open source is that uh, for me, this is the only way to make it big, uh, to have a zero threshold to start with the Things Network. Um, also, um, we have, uh, it's not only sharing code, but it's also sharing a lot of expertise. So we have a forum, uh, which is the most active LoRa forum um, in the world. We have the Things Network Labs, where you can share projects and ideas and, and how-tos, tutorials. Uh, you can add steps and things, um, uh, code snippets. Um, we have community pages, uh, so we have um, uh, 268 communities. And um, this is the Things Network in uh, Zurich. Um, they have uh, 50 gateways and they cover Zurich and the surroundings. Um, we have a web shop. This is our team. Uh, we started last year, uh, my co-founder and I. And since January, we grew our team to uh, 15 people. Uh, there are 14 here, but there is another guy that was, didn't fit on the slide. Um, it's our developer advocate. Um, yeah, talking about diversity, uh, if you look at these uh, faces, then um, yeah, it's all guys, um, uh, except one, uh, we're all white. Um, uh, this, is, this is for us something that I'm, I'm working on personally to, to make our team more diverse. Um, but diversity for us is also to enable uh, anyone to build a network. So uh, you're not, you don't rely on any operator to deploy a network, but we enable with this technology people in Africa or in uh, South America to deploy their own LoRa network and to create connectivity for their use cases. Um, so after we, we covered Amsterdam in, in four weeks, um, uh, many communities started to pop up. Um, so yeah, like I said, 268, uh, they are everywhere. Uh, mostly concentrated in Europe currently. That's because LoRa is a bit more known in Europe. 
uh, also I think because we are um, originally from Europe. Uh, around London we have a couple of gateways, um, I don't know if these numbers are readable but you can see uh, around Reading 15 gateways and a couple of more. Um, in London not so many but it's, it's still starting and growing so that's pretty cool. Um, all the communities, they have an initiator and they all have a face and the initiator is usually a guy that is well connected uh, in the city or area that has a professional network uh, or um, uh, contacts with the city or with universities or with local companies uh, to form uh, a group and to build a network in their city or area. So that makes it also um, uh, scalable. So deploying a network, um, yeah. Uh, you can deploy the network that you need, um, you can control the required quality of service, uh, you can run your own network if you want, but we can also do that for you as a hosted solution uh, where we offer uh, SLAs. There is a um, public community network that um, has a managed keychain, so this is where you trust uh, us, the Things Network Foundation, with your security keys. You can also keep the key for yourself, but then you need to run your own handler. Uh, you can also uh, have your own gateway and connect uh, for fallback coverage to the community network, but you can also have your own private network that is not connected to anything else. Um, it's not only connectivity. Um, so one of the other projects that we are working on is uh, the sensor fleet, and this takes other costs into account. So it's not only uh, minimizing communication costs, uh, or, or, uh, but also uh, development, installation, provisioning, maintenance, data processing costs. Um, and for that we are building, um, it's, uh, it's something on top of the Things Network, it's called Sensor Fleet, uh, and it's a library for Arduino and for ARM Embed, uh, and it allows you to configure and provision your devices over the air uh, using uh, the 51 bytes uh, LoRa downlink payload. And um, so this is, this is not really readable, I suppose, but this is like configuring a device and saying, hey, uh, this device, it has a, sen a temperature sensor connected to analog port A1. Uh, I want to have my data every 10 minutes uh, or when it changes more than 5%, for example. That this is a very small instruction that we encode in a couple of bytes. Um, on top of this, we can make it in the cloud uh, compatible with existing protocols such as uh, lightweight M2M. Uh, but it turns out that most of these protocols are too heavy to support natively uh, on LoRaWAN. If you look at the use cases, um, yeah, of course we have the uh, parking space monitoring, we have uh, smart trash cans, air quality in buildings. Um, these, this is relatively easy to, to do. Um, uh, and it's important that we do this because this also gives us a lot of insight in the technology in real world using of uh, the Things Network but also LoRa in general. Um, but all these use cases are looking, uh, yeah, looking backward, like moving forward, but looking backward. So it's like uh, first car that is, was a carriage without a horse and it's much like replacing communications technology. Um, but this technology, uh, long range, low power, uh, low cost, uh, almost autonomous devices allow for many other use cases that are not possible uh, currently with IP communication. Um, so for example, um, we, have, we are working with uh, SafeCast and SafeCast is a uh, initiative um, started after the Fukushima meltdown in 2011 uh, where the Japanese government wasn't really open with um, sharing information about the radiation uh, around Fukushima. Uh, actually, there was a cloud of radiation going inland, and uh, people um, yeah, were, were left in the dark about uh, what was going on. So um, this is where SafeCast started. To, it's like a community project where they build these devices, and they um, measure the radiation, uh, GPS coordinates, write it to an SD card, um, and then uh, plot it on a map. So you see all those roads, um, and they use interpolation to create these nice colors. And this is a really good use case for, uh, for the Things Network because um, you can set up your own network, you can just uh, deploy a couple of gateways, uh, drop sensors out there um, in places where you don't want to go because of radiation, for example, uh, and you can start measuring uh, the levels. So um, we are working with them to put uh, a LoRa chip in this device and to connect it to uh, the Things Network. So um, yeah, that's our mission. Um, decentralized, open, crowdsourced, 
Internet of Things data network. Um, we do workshops and it's pretty cool to see uh, people that have no coding experience to build working use cases. This is the last one I wanted to share with you. Uh, it's a smart parking solution with a magnetic sensor to, to uh, see if there's a car underneath. It uses um, a LoRa. Uh, and this is with zero coding. So this is just using existing cloud solutions, Node-RED, uh, to create a dashboard that says, hey, there's a car, hey, there's no car, there's a car, there's no car, and put it in a, in a, in a graph um, without any line of code. So th this, is, this is one of the examples uh, what we do it for. So thank you very much. Thanks.